to see you all uh, here this morning, and it's good to see the sun shining outside as well. Uh, and if the wind isn't blowing, the roads won't get yucky, and it'll all be good. So, um, just a couple of announcements. Uh, there's an Odd Fellows service this afternoon in Devil's Lake at 2 o'clock if anyone wants to join uh, Pastor and Mary in that. Uh, this week, our Wednesday, normal Wednesday night programs. Uh, the only change will be coming up uh, the Wednesday before Easter. We'll cancel that Wednesday night service and have a Thursday evening service uh, for the Easter season. So Thursday the 29th at 7 o'clock there will be a service here. Any other Announcements that need to be made? I was just going to mention that, uh, of course, uh, most of you know, or all of you know probably, that we were in Texas for uh, a month, and we got to spend a little bit of time with Keith and Olivia, and they are the missionary of the month, this month, so uh, it was good to, we spent, had a couple meals with them, and, and spent time on the campus there, of course, and I spent some time in his office with him as well. Uh, he's the tech guy there, I mean, doing the fiber optics into buildings and that kind of stuff, so he's, uh, and uh, they're trying to get a lot of their classes online so people wouldn't have to necessarily even travel to RGBI to, to take those, so that's, that's what his uh, deal is. Uh, we also got to meet uh, Phil, uh, Keith's brother, and his wife are there too, they're, they're there for a month. And uh, he works with computers, and I'm not exactly sure what, what he does, but he was working with Keith almost exclusively there. And they're going to be back again next winter uh, as well. So that was uh, good to meet him as well. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, there's like 30, 40 couples there working every day for four or five months. And I, I don't know where else that takes place in a, in a college situation. I just can't imagine. That does so, but it's a pretty neat deal. Certainly, things that that happen there couldn't happen without those those volunteers. So it was good to be to get to know them and be a part of them. Um, let's have a word of prayer uh, this morning. And oh, I was just going to mention one one more thing. Uh, the, the biggest thing at RGBI right now is that they're getting a new tower put up for their radio uh, in Roma which is a little distance away, but that's going to beam into, into Mexico. Um, the president of RGBI has shared that a, a thousand people last year feedback back to the radio station that accepted Christ because of, the, because of the radio station they have now. So they're going to get one that's going to go even farther into Mexico. And that should, they got the permits and stuff, should be like now. They're going to start putting that power up. So just pray that that all happens without Someone, they had, there was a protest time for the frequency. If someone else would protest about the frequency they were going to use. And that was up by the 15th. So we're talking days. So, anyway, okay, let's pray. Lord, thanks again uh, for the day you've given us. Thanks for the week. Thanks for the health and strength you give daily and, and that we just come to expect. And uh, thanks also for this time we can spend together. And I pray that we'll be open to you as we uh, have our service. I do pray for uh, Keith and Olivia as they spend their time down at RGBI uh, just doing uh, what needs to be done so your word can be given to students and, and uh, just the new technology that takes place that, that they can take advantage of. pray also for this uh, tower that's about to be erected for their radio station. I pray that that would uh, go forth without a hitch to and, and uh, more people will be exposed to your word given uh, through the college. Pray that you just bless uh, Keith as they continue to be faithful and work there and, and uh, do the work that they do. Just to guide our service this morning, help us to be open to you again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> our call to worship this morning from Psalm 33, 1 through 3. All you that are righteous shout for joy, for what the Lord has done, praise Him, all you that obey Him. Let us give thanks to the Lord our hearts, sing to Him with strength Sing a new song to Him and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord holds true, and we trust everything He does. Lord. Oh, let's start by singing Jesus' love. 
loves me. Even me.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and the opportunity, Lord, to come into your house and to worship you. We thank you that you care about our needs and you care about the things that concern us. So, Lord, we bring before you, Lord, those who are a part of our family, their care centers. We ask that you be their strength, that you give them ample grace for each day, Lord, also for their family members. We also hold before you those who have medical problems, who have sickness and fighting pain. We ask, Lord, that you be our healer and our strength. We especially hold before you Mason's cousin John and his family as he struggles with the battle against cancer. We pray, Father, that you'd be his healer and his deliverer. We pray, Father, for the outpouring, Lord, of your grace for his family, that you would show yourself, Lord, as a loving and good God as they go through this time. But we also hold before you, hold to ask that you would be your healer and your strength in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for those who are partners in missions with. We ask in the name of Jesus that you would give them great fruitfulness. We ask, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you let our country be turned back to you, Lord, that you let real revival, real renewal and repentance come to our nation, that you would use us in, us in this process. We also hold before you Mary and Grady as they go to minister with the children today. Father, bless that time. Lord, we thank you for taking care of us and meeting our needs. And Lord, we bring our offerings now to you as our worship and with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen.
So do you know that we're actually called as Christians to be courteous? That it's part of the call of God in our lives? I don't think it's something that we usually think that much about, the fact that God has a, a way for us to behave, and we think of courteous as being something that's just a nice thing to have. But in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, God's word says, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, and be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. And so we see from this word that God calls us to be courteous, not to be rude, and that it's part of the fact that we're made to be a blessing, and we're made to be blessed. In the last few weeks, we've been talking about practicing our faith and using 1 Corinthians 13, the love is, is our pattern. <clears throat> this morning, I want to continue on in verse 5, where it says, Love is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not easily provoked, and does not take into account a wrong suffered. And so it says, Love isn't rude, and does not seek its own. In other words, it's not selfish. And those two are put together on purpose, because selfishness is the root of rudeness. So when a person is rude, it means they don't care how they're interacting with other people. They don't care how their words affect someone. They don't care how their body language affects someone. They don't care how their actions. So it goes together with selfishness. And self-seeking is the opposite of the Christian spirit because it's me-oriented instead of you-oriented. So God calls us to care about the needs of others, including how our actions and our attitudes affect them. And to be rude, discourteous is the opposite of the spirit of Jesus Christ. And where and with whom do you think we should be most compassionate, courteous, and kind? Does anybody know where I'm going with this? Yep. At home, with our family, with our spouses, with our children, with our brothers and our sisters. If we're going to demonstrate real Christianity, let it be at home with the people that we're closest to. And it's a funny thing how that's sort of the opposite of the reality, isn't it, right? Like, normally we would never in a million years be discourteous, or hope not, at least, maybe some would be. But I think in general, we're much more careful that we'd be courteous and kind and compassionate with the people around us that don't even know us that well. And we would allow ourselves to say very discourteous things, be very rude to those who are the closest to us, which is not what God wants to have in our, in our homes and in our hearts. And over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the idea of let's put our sight on the target that God's word has for us, as opposed to what we see or what we've allowed to have happen or what generally can be happening in the Christian life and the Christian church in general. I'm not sure if Rodney got here before me. <laughs> I suspect that's last week's water. <laughs> those little green things floating in their human way. So we want to aim high. We want to aim at what God is calling us to, not hit our standards, but his standards is what we want to aim at. And we're called to be kind and courteous. And you know, it's interesting, many have allowed rudeness and discourtesy to become the norm in their families, with their siblings, with their spouses. And it can be easy to forget that we're called to be courteous and to be a blessing. I think the other place it's easy to forget those things is like when we're behind the wheel of our car, frustrated at some knucklehead, right? And it's real easy to honk the horn and, and uh, say things. Not that I'm sure any of you guys would do that. Or some Christians at sporting events. I think that they misunderstood the call. They think the call to be courteous, thank you is only for when the calls go their way or their team is winning, right? But Christian love, the kind that Jesus approves of, is kind, patient, caring, and courteous. And it goes on to say that it isn't easily provoked. And I want us to just look at this for a moment, because in some versions it says isn't, isn't provoked to anger or doesn't get angry. And that's not quite the, the, the nuance of this word, I don't think. The idea of it is that Love isn't easily provoked to any emotion. 
to negatively. So it isn't easily provoked to anger, it's not easily provoked to, to irritation, to exasperation, or to offense. And so our human nature, because it's selfish, is very easily provoked. And this is that battle we've been talking about over the last few weeks between our, the, our redeemed nature that's being sanctified, being changed, and the fact that we're still living in this with our fallen human nature and we have this war going on in our fallen human nature is very selfish and it's very, it can be very easily uh, exasperated, irritated, and, and, uh, and angered. So in other words, we can say it like this, love isn't thin-skinned, it isn't defensive, it isn't easily irritated. And, you know, it doesn't say, God's definition of love doesn't say that it's never provoked, it just says that it doesn't get provoked very easily. There's times when Jesus was provoked. But it isn't something that happens like this, it's not something that just pops up like this. And the reasons for being easily provoked to anger or whatever is, is first one would be spiritual immaturity. One of the ways we know that we're growing spiritually is that we're putting to death our human nature. And God doesn't do that for us, we do that. He saved us, but it's up to us to crucify our flesh. It's us that it's that, that point of choice where we say we're going to do something or we're not going to do it. We're going to respond a certain way or we're not going to. And so spiritual immaturity, one of the marks of it is, is that we're still easily offended, easily angered, etc. Another time is it can be personality. Some people, their personality is that they're short-fused and they're, they're quick to, they're emotional and they very quickly spark up. And that doesn't excuse it. And I just want to make this clear because this isn't about personalities. This isn't like, okay, well, I get to get out of, a, I, get a, I, I, get a, I get to do what I want free card because I'm simply wired that way. Well, all of us have wirings that are contrary to the Word of God. And it's our responsibility, even if we have to be wired where it's maybe easier for us to get offended than it is the next guy, it's still our responsibility to do what God wants us to do and to be like Christ. Sometimes it's a habit that's never been broken, and we have not allowed the Holy Spirit to mold and conform us to his image. And I also want to point out that sometimes people who are easily angered, easily exasperated, irritated, easily defensive or offended is because they've been hurt or they've been wounded. Sometimes they get provoked when nothing is even intended. In other words, they're... they're they're cocked and ready to go because they have been hurt, abused in ways that they think that's going to happen to them now. They think you're going to do that or I'm going to do that to them. And they're ready to respond to, to, a, to a phantom offense. Those who have been verbally abused or been the butt of jokes, those who have been deceived or had treacherous things done to them can often be, they can have out of that wounded heart, they can find themselves to be very easily provoked to an emotion, whether it's anger or whatever. But it's still our responsibility, if we have all kind of wounds and stuff like that, it's still our responsibility to respond the way God wants us to respond. I have a, uh, I have a uh, target revolver. And if you don't know anything about target shooting, the goal is to hit the target. You might not have guessed that, huh? But these guns are, they have two positions. One is called, uh, uh, when you pull the trigger and you pull it all the way back, it's called double action. It's where the hammer comes up and then goes back down. It takes about 10 pounds of pull on this particular gun to, to shoot it as a double action gun. But in competitions, you don't shoot it that way. You pull the hammer back so that it's ready to go. And then the trigger has been altered by a, by a, a gunsmith to have just two pounds of pull, right at two pounds of pull. And so when you shoot this gun, you don't pull the hammer back and walk around with it because anything will make that thing fire, right? Instead, you put yourself in the position you're gonna shoot it in, you aim at what you wanna aim at, and only then you pull that hammer back because you know it could go off at any time. Well, there's some people that have an emotional hair trigger. That's what sometimes they call those things, hair triggers, is they're, they're just ready to go off like that. Maybe you've heard the saying about being half-cocked. Do you know it doesn't probably mean what you might have thought it meant? Sometimes uh, 
it, it, maybe it's, it's, it's morphed a little bit, but the, the saying came from early guns. A safety mechanism was put in, and uh, it meant that when you put the, the hammer of the gun into the half back position, half cocked, it could, you couldn't pull the trigger then. It was a safety mechanism. Also, because it was halfway back, if the gun dropped or was struck by something, the hammer resting on the primer couldn't accidentally shoot the bullet. So it was considered a safety mechanism. It's a clever idea, I guess. But as uh, machining wasn't that good back in the day, and uh, the mechanism was the weakest part of the gun, that safety mechanism was. And sometimes a person would be carrying that gun in the half cocked position, and all of a sudden, without any warning, it would just unexpectedly go off. And you can imagine that would be quite a, a frightening thing. Well, there's some people that are, they're like that when it comes to their emotions, when it comes to their responses. They're like those half cocked guns. They go off when they're not, you're not expecting it. It's, it's just out of the same amount of, of provocation to them creates this outburst and this emotional uproar compared to a different person. So to go off half-cocked meant that it was unexpected and dangerous and unplanned. And a person who goes off half-cocked means they respond in an explosive way when it isn't expected and it's out of proportion to the situation. Some gotten their have not gotten their reactions in control. They're like that half-cocked gun or that hair trigger. And this is at the heart of it, right, what we're talking about right now. This is at the heart of it. We cannot control circumstances. We can't control people. We can't control situations. We can't control the fact that we are going to be in situations where people will, be, will attempt to provoke us. Situations can provoke us. We have no control over that. You can't control how many people are hateful. You can't control how many people are immature. You can't, uh, you, we have just no control over what other people do. But we have absolute control over how we respond to situations. And that's what God's word is reminding us, is that it says love is not easily provoked. This is something that's, that the, the spirit of God in us gives us power if we yield and surrender to him that we can have control over our emotions. We don't have to, to uh, uh, lose our control. There was a surgeon in the 18th century. He was a British guy. His name was John Hunter. And he was quite smart in some ways and quite foolish in other ways. He was a, a pioneer in the field of surgery. He served as a surgeon to the king. And he suffered from angina. And he discovered that his attacks were brought on by anger. When he got really angry, angry his heart would start hurting. And he'd have excruciating pain. And this was, his, this was his summation of that. He said, this is terrible. My life is at the mercy of any scoundrel who chooses to put me in a passion. So in normal English, he says, this is terrible. My life is at the mercy of anyone who wants to get me angry. And sure enough, one day at a meeting of their board at the St. George Hospital in London, he got in a heated argument with another board member. He walked out of the room and dropped dead. His idea was that he had no control over his response, that it was someone else's fault how he responded. His life, and in this case his death, was, de was dictated by someone because he refused to control his response to provocation. In other words, anybody could get his goat. Now, who knows that expression? Can you just raise your hand? Do you know the expression, to get your goat? I thought this was like a super common expression. My wife said she's never heard of it, to get, to get someone's goat. And uh, it, means, it means, today it means to get to, 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 uh, to provoke someone in a way that causes them to lose their composure, to get their goat. And uh, this guy, this surgeon, anybody could get his goat. Anybody could find a way to provoke him. And the phrase, do you know where it comes from, anybody can get his goat? to get his goal. In 1912, there was an author in an article, he claims that the first use of that word, to get his goat, came from a horse track, uh, a, a, a racehorse owner, 
And it's, it's common th then and it's common even now to put a goat in with your horse. I don't know if you know that or not, but the reason is, is because, because horses, these thoroughbred horses are real nervous and if you put a goat in with them, they become fast friends with this goat and they become calm and relaxed, take their goat away, they don't want to eat, they start pacing and back and forth and they won't rest and then they don't perform as well. So it's, it, even today, uh, uh, I was reading about some lady at the Arlington International Racetrack who said that uh, when she sells a horse, she sells the, she sells the goat with it. Because it would be cruel to leave to sell the horse and to make him lose his goat. So anyway, the way this, the article went was that uh, the owner of a racehorse put his goat in there uh, with his horse. This horse was expected to win the next day. And at midnight, somewhere around midnight, someone came in and stole the goat from that stall. And the next day that horse was so, I think the author called it, he pined for his goat to the point that his ears were back and he didn't want to run. And someone looked at that horse in its wretched condition and said, what is wrong with your horse? And he said, someone got his goat. Well, <laughs> I was thinking about that, about those goats. One of the ways we can avoid being easily provoked is to, to not keep goats, right? Refuse to have triggers that set you off. It'll only get your goat if you got a goat to get, right? Have you ever, I've met people, they, they walk around with, with triggers and they even tell you what they are. They go, you know, I got a pet peeve about so-and-so. And they're just waiting for somebody to do that thing that's going to offend them and get them angry. Well, I've got, you know, so they're, they're already setting themselves up to be easily provoked, right? Well, I was thinking probably the best way to do it, just let the goats out. Why have those things where we know in advance we're going to allow ourselves to respond in a way that isn't good? Another way we can avoid being easily provoked is not to light the fires too quickly. So in other words, choose not to respond to every and any provocation. A long time ago in England, for actually for thousands of years, they used fire beacons as a method of communication to warn of invasion. So the guys guarding the coast, this coast here, they were their job was to watch for invaders, and they had fire uh, uh, stacks of wood, sometimes on the ground, sometimes put up in stone towers. And when they saw uh, activity that looked like they were going to be invaded, they would light that fire. The next area over, next village over, would see that fire, they would light their fire, and by this way it would be like a telegraph warning them, and then they would, they would launch a response against these invaders. Worked well, but in 1544, some overzealous watchmen repeatedly lit fire beacons, only to later find that there was no invasion, it was just a couple of fishing boats coming home. Another time they lit them and it turned out it was just some ships off course. And the problem of this being easily provoked into lighting warning fires was it caused a chain reaction. A lot of people were involved in this. Once those fires got lit, the next fires got lit, people left their jobs, their work, their farm, and they raced to defend the country. And it could take them a long time to get to the shore. When they finally got there, they found out that all that time and that energy and their dropping of everything that they were doing was in vain because there was no invasion. It was someone just being too quick to light the fires. An English pastor used the lighting of the beacons in a book he wrote, and he said, can you imagine if one should set the beacons on fire upon the landing of every small boat, what continual combustions and tumults there would be in the land. I like that. And that's the problem when we are too quick to be provoked to get ready for war at the slightest provocation, and not even to look for reasons to light the fire, just to quickly light them. And so there was a decree sent out that there was to be no fire beacons lit unless it was well known that at least 10 hostile French ships were on the coast, and whether it was obvious that their intention was to make a landing. So don't be easily provoked into responding. God's word says that Christian love is difficult to provoke. And just as, a, as the fires should only be lit when there's a real threat of invasion, we shouldn't allow ourselves to be provoked by all the little boats. A lot of things we should just probably let go 
and not allow them, not even allow ourselves to respond to them. And we need to be careful. We need to avoid being easily provoked because they're unhealthy for us, they're unhealthy for our families, they're unhealthy for relationships, they're an unhealthy witness as well. Especially angry outbursts and temper tantrums. I remember Mary and I, with our kids, we were visiting the States when we were missionaries overseas and we stayed with some friends of ours for about a week or so. And they had two children. And when we got up in the morning, I think we woke up in the morning to hear screaming. I mean, it was a knockdown drag out going on in the kitchen. It was this husband and wife, these Christian friends of ours. And they were screaming bloody murder at each other. And eventually the guy who walked out of the house slammed the door while she was still screaming at him and then screeched out the driveway in his car. And we were, oh, we were honestly just astounded. And later that day when those kids came home from school, the older boy got mad at the younger boy, grabbed whatever he was fooling around with, and then started screaming at him. And it was amazing that those kids had learned that behavior from their parents where it had become a norm. Like that was a, like go to work, church on Sunday and worship Jesus and read the Bible and love God and then have this completely anti-Christian behavior towards each other. And of course, sometimes, especially with outbursts of anger, they can be very frightening to people and especially children and families. I remember pastoring in, in, uh, in the South, one of our churches there, and uh, there was a little boy in the, uh, I was the children's church guy who was a children's pastor at that church. And uh, I remember one of these little boys, maybe six, seven, eight years old, and he was terrified. He walked around like he was walking on eggshells, he was jumpy, and uh, he was definitely a, a, a closed up little kid. And it turns out that his father was a screamer. He would just be, un he would just unexpectedly get angry at something and shout and scream. And this, it was affecting this kid's personality. And it's not healthy. It's not a healthy environment for humans to live in. And especially it's not healthy for humans who say they're Christians. And eventually what happened is that lady ended up divorcing that guy because he went from screaming to actually uh, to, to shoving her around and pushing her around. And after a few months away from that environment of anger and outburst, burst that boy started acting like a normal kid. And he came out of his shell. But I think the easiest way to avoid being easily provoked is to remember how gracious and slow to anger God is with us. That's at the heart of all this love is, right? It always comes back to what God has done for us first. God has been merciful to us when we didn't deserve mercy. God is patient with us when we're, when we're foolish, when we're sinful, when we're unsanctified. God is kind to us when we don't deserve any of that because he's good and kind and gracious. And he asks us to be like him. The same spirit that he sh that he is that he's put inside of us, that spirit wants to do that kind of work in us, that we would be like our God. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 17, talking about Israel who refused to obey God. He says, and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them. They hardened their hearts, and in their rebellion, they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. So talk about the Israelites when they were shaking their fist at God after God had demonstrated mercy to them. Talking about Israel when God had delivered them from the hand of Pharaoh, and they wanted to go back. I mean, how, how easily it would be for God to just go, you know what, enough is enough. But he goes on and says, but you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful. Listen to this, slow to anger, amen, abundant in kindness, and you did not forsake them. That's how God treats us. And he calls us, James 1.19, he calls us, you, this you know, my beloved brethren, God's people must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Amen. Let's live out our faith, let's practice our faith, let's put the standard up high, and let's live out the love that God has called us to. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, and we thank you for the 
just the new life that you've called us to, the extraordinary life, the abundant life. And Lord, we know that we struggle with our, our fallen humanity and our sinful nature. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us, Lord, crucify it, put it to death. Lord, that we'd walk in your spirit. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that we would be uh, not just takers of your grace, but we'd be givers of it too. That we'd not just enjoy the benefits of your mercy, Lord, that we would be merciful towards others as well. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus for those parts of us where we have a hard time controlling our responses. I ask, Lord, that you would develop in us, Lord. Father, that kind of constraint. Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that you'd help us, Lord, yield to you and your spirit, Lord, that we would be like you in the name of Jesus. Amen. rise and praise the, the, praise the name of Jesus.